And a very good evening to you and welcome to this evening's edition of Politics 101. It's Friday night. It's Friday night. Good evening to you if you're joining us from Guyana, if you are joining us from our Caribbean, our Caribbean, our Caribbean. And as you know what we say on this program, the Caribbean has never been an island construct. The Caribbean has always been a regional construct. So, you know, we, we are we are part of the Caribbean. Don't let anybody tell you all otherwise, and you all don't have to quarrel for it as um, CLR James. CLR, we're going to do something on CLR James one of these days, because what I, I'm trying to do is to introduce our audience to some new ways and new perspectives and new thinkers and so on. CLR James, if I were to paraphrase him, um, would say would ask, what do they know of the Caribbean who only the Caribbean knows? Of course, he was uh, um, that famous statement he made on cricket. What do they know of cricket who only cricket knows? Our Caribbean, good evening to you, whether you're in Trinidad and Tobago, whether you're in Barbados or Antigua, uh, St. Lucia, Grenada, uh, Montserrat, wherever you are, welcome to uh, Politics 101. And, you know, some people... Uh, out there in the quote-unquote U.S. Virgin Islands, and they they, they want me to say um, quote-unquote uh, because the U.S. Virgin Islands are very much Caribbean. Hello to Mr. Benjamin out there in the Virgin Islands, um, St. Croix, St. Croix, St. Thomas, and um, I remember the first time I went to St. Croix, I thought, I thought I was in Guyana, flat, flat, like Guyana. So those of you out there in the Virgin Islands, uh, the other Virgin Islands, what they call the British Virgin Islands, welcome to you all. And if I don't call you, it's not because I forget. One of the things about the Caribbean, when you study the Caribbean, teach the Caribbean, you're talking about studying 36 different countries. And some may argue they're a little bit more than that. Um, you know, um, I'm, 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 I'm teaching this semester um, a course on introduction to the African diaspora. And of course, when we get to do the Caribbean part of the African diaspora, um, it's, it's, it's always a little bit more um, challenging because you're talking about the French Caribbean, the Francophone Caribbean, the English-speaking Caribbean, Anglophone Caribbean, and the Lusophone Caribbean, and so on and so on and so forth, you know? Because of colonialism, we have these different parts of the Caribbean. Um, uh, and that's always a challenge, but it's always a joy because it's, um, you know, um, such a wonderful place, you know. CLR James used to say, what we have in the Caribbean is a 17th century economy and a 20th century people. You know, he, he was so um, great thinker, great thinker, CLR James. Good evening to you in the Caribbean. To those of you who are joining us from Europe, good morning. It's just past midnight, just past midnight um good night to you um troopers there and uh, you know how you all do it i don't know because it's 12 o'clock now and by the time you all get to sherry duncan it's one o'clock and by the time you all get to mark ben's cup it's two o'clock by the time mark done is two three in the morning and yet people from out there tune in to these programs um, welcome to you all. Welcome to you all joining us from England and those of you who are joining us from France. I know some of you from France. Uh, good evening. And I am never going to forget our brothers and sisters in Paramaribo. And you know, when we Guyanese say Paramaribo, well, old time Guyanese, when we say Paramaribo, we mean Suriname. And when we say Kayan, we mean, we mean, we mean French Guyana. Um, Welcome to all of you, all of you. How about my friends in West Bobbies? Good evening. Tonight we're going to be talking Venezuela. We are going to be talking Venezuela. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, night before the last, we had um, Nor Aubrey Norton on. And thanks to you all for all the feedback you all sent in on that program. Uh, Aubrey was on and he dealt uh, at length with uh, um, the political partisan um uh, perspective on the Venezuelan issue. And I did promise last week that I was going to uh, broaden the coverage uh, by bringing different perspectives on the Venezuelan issue. And I am true to my word tonight, as I've been advertising, Dr. Mark Curtin is 
here. They are backstage and ready, ready to roll. So we are going to be talking with a Latin American expert, not an expert from Latin America, a Guyanese Latin American expert, I mean, someone who has studied and has a good grasp of the political motions of um, South America, Central America, and so forth, Latin America uh, in general. So he's here. And uh, please share the link. Please share the link. I know it's 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 Saturday night, um, uh, Friday night. Sorry, we um, normally on Friday night. It's Dr. Vince Adams. So you, Vince Adams fans, um, uh, Dr. Adams is going to be back next week, Friday, um, and we are going to be talking Venezuela with uh, with. Britain. Tell you what I'll do. I'll give you all a couple of minutes to get. Uh, um, yourself together, get settled, because we're going to be having some real serious discussion tonight. We're going to let the popular artists speak for us for a couple of minutes, and then we'll come back with Dr. Mark Corton. Um, you know, some people say that our national anthem, our popular culture national anthem, um, it, was, it, it burns inside. Uh, by Johnny Braff. Well, the old timers used to say that. Well, this is another of our national anthems in song. Dave Martin. Um, play this song out. <laughs> There were peaceful people struggling with struggles. I mean, I look for trouble, just ask around. But when outside places, from foreign places, talk about taking over, being back in down. So we ain't giving up no mountain, we ain't giving up no tree, we ain't giving up the river. That's the law. Not one blue socket, not one rice grain, not one for us, not a blade of grass. I will love the open country of the roof and on it. And the Essex Weibo, the time of night. We may criticize it, this is a home we love it. And we mean to keep it, we have that right. So we ain't giving up no mountain, we ain't giving up no tree, we ain't giving up no river. That belongs to me, not no one to suck it. Not one rice bread, not one for us, not a made of grass, not one golden apple, not one jamun, not a drop of water from the farmer road, not one breadfruit, not one white tea, not one guinea, not one lime tree, not a one sapotilla. Not one Caroline, not one sugar cane, or a dry of life. Not one sherry girl, not one crackate, not one guinea, eh, eh. not one blue sake, not one rice bread. Then it's with a hard your ass, not a bit of grass. Land is our land now. We're gonna make it somehow. We will bend like a bow, but never break. Our fathers came here and they lived and died here. And we're moving from here. Make no mistake. So we are giving up the mountain. We are giving up the tree. We are giving up the river that belongs to me. Not the one blue sake, not the one rice bread, not 
National treasure there, Dave Martin. And you all hear, you all hear the Guyanese, the Guyanese contribution to the art form, you know, that that genre of music, Calypso music, the mother music of the English-speaking Caribbean, a wam pam pam, and a wap pam pam. That, 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 that's the Guyanese version. All the different countries in the Caribbean, you see the Calypso thing is all a wee thing. Um, Trinidad, of course, we acknowledge is the center the, where it um, uh, grew fastest. But um, each Caribbean territory brings to the Calypso something. The Bajans bring something, but you all know that. And the, if you listen to the Antiguans, they bring a rap, 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 And it's, you know, they, they, and even when you listen to Byron Lee and the Jamaicans who used to play, who used to play Calypso before the 1950s when reggae, emerge, you know, ska emerge in the 1950s. But before that, Jamaica was in the forefront of Calypso music. In fact, reggae itself um, borrows a little bit of Calypso and, and so on and so forth. But, you know, we, br we bring that wap up, wap up, wap up story to the, the, the Calypso. Good evening to all of you. Um, not a blade of grass. Yes, um, Lynette, not a blade of grass. Uh, Prince, good evening, good evening, Marcia Fordyce, Desri Hunter, um, welcome to Politics 101 tonight, Gloria Pod is always with us here, always urging us on with very, very informative um, comments. Tonight we are going to kick it off with Venezuela, and we are introducing a new guest, and as I always say to you all, when we have new guests, behave yourself. Behave yourself. Kennedy Florman, my brother from Maryland, welcome. Good evening. Good evening. You all clock turned back in that part of the America of, of America. So what is now um uh is now what? Just after six. Just after six out there in the east coast of the United States of America. Quasi, uh, good night to you, wherever you are. Good evening to you, Esther. So we have in um, Dr. Courtney for the first time um, on Politics 101, and you all are very ideological. You all are very picky, um, and, 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 and you all are very exact, and you all are very knowledgeable. But behave yourself, because when you see you have new people to the family you want to welcome in the best way. Let's bring Dr. Cortnan to Politics 101 for the first time. Dr. Mark Corton, good evening to you, my brother. Thank you so very much, and good evening to you, your viewers and listeners. It is indeed a, a distinct pleasure to make my debut, in a sense, on your program. And I've been looking at some of them very instructive, very educative, as they say sometimes. <laughs> yes. And, and I'm, I'm happy to see that you are moving 
in the direction of where many stations are to go. That is to sensitize the Guyanese people and the diaspora and others in relation to the Venezuela-Guyana border issue. So thanks for having me. I'm appreciative of that for that invitation. And thank you. And you know, we scholars sometimes are put in a funny position, whether we are speaking as scholars, whether we are speaking as nationalists, whether we are speaking as citizens, sometimes we have to wear all these hats. I remember you called me on an issue a couple of years where you say, David, this is Mark talking to you, man to man. <laughs> Mark talking to David, your friend, David talking to Mark. Um, tonight, Mark, I, I can't help but to say that I want you to speak both as a scholar, but also as a Guyanese, because um, uh, the Venezuela, this Venezuelan issue is much more than meets the eye. Let me pose my first question to you, and that is, why should we on a Friday night be spending an hour and more talking about Venezuela and what is, what is coming out of Venezuela as Guyanese? Why should we be spending our Friday night talking about that? Oh, thank you very much for the question. I would say that every night now, we have to look at what is an unprecedented level of aggression being demonstrated by the Venezuelan government. And I think that it's important to sensitize our people in relation to that issue. And I believe also that we ourselves as Guyanese need to keep abreast of what is taking place, some of the propaganda, some of the PR that is coming out of Venezuela. And I think that we need to counter that with, by ensuring that our people are aware, informed of the trajectory which we see Venezuela moving into in relation to this issue. Now, I don't know, I, I think one could argue that over the years, and I, I, I don't want to sound political, but to go back to the 1970s and 80s, everybody was singing not a blade of grass. As a matter of fact, some people are saying that now we're singing, do we want with we? But I mean, it is, it is to my mind important to go back to that era when we, we saw every citizen being fully educated on the issue from primary, even some people tell me kindergarten, the children were singing not a blade of grass in the 70s and 80s. And we, we had everybody on board in a sense, cross transcending political, ethnic, and other, and other lines. And I think we have to get back there because this is the most important national issue which has to be confronted as a people. And we don't have, I don't think we have time to have the differences which turn up every time some issues such as this are, you know, emerge in contemporary times. So I think we have to take a step back, look at what took place in the 70s and 80s at the height of, of, the, of, of the aggression being demonstrated by by Venezuela and the resilience shown by the Guyanese people. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Corton. And I, 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 I do remember 1982, which was um, uh, the end of the 12 years sort of truce um, in hostilities. Well, not truce in hostilities because there was never hostility from Guyana. Um, but when there was a pause by Venezuelan hostility, something that was brokered um, by Dr. Eric Williams, um, the late Prime Minister of Trinidad and Tobago. And in 1982, that um, pause came to an end. And um, I remember the president of Venezuela at that time immediately up in the ante because, of course, they did not um, renew um, that, 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 that truce. And I remember being part of, very much part of a political party at that time, which was very hostile to the government of the day. But I remember Dave Martin's um, Not a Blade of Grass um, uh, filling the airwaves and the byways and the roadways and so forth. And I do remember at that time that even fierce, 
fierce um, competitors against each other in the partisan political sphere, really um, uh, uh, wrapping our minds and our solidarity uh, around this uh, issue. Um, let me let me let me allow you to put this thing in historical context because yes. part of what we're dealing with is is history. Sure. Um, because to understand what Venezuela is going to be, um, and 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 to put it in its 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 context, we have to um, bring to the fore the historical context. Walk sure. us walk us through the historical development of this issue. Right. Remember in the eighteen hundreds. As a matter of fact, the Monroe Doctrine, the issues related to the Western Hemisphere idea, which was popular in the, in the US, the, you know, the whole issue of the sphere of influence, all of those were the 1800s, which impacted the relations between the US and countries of, in the hemisphere. By the 1890s, when there was concern about the borders being demarcated across Latin America and in, in particular South America. We saw where in 1897, the Treaty of Washington, there was the establishment of a tribunal. And in 1899, after the tribunal sat, there was what was termed a full, final, and perfect agreement in relation to the demarcation of the boundaries between then British Guyana, a colleague of a, a, a colony of Great Britain and Venezuela, a larger state. Now one could look at it also in that period when other uh, boundaries were being demarcated. In 1904, after arbitration, the boundaries between Guyana and Brazil were demarcated. And since that time, Brazil has recognized the sanctity of, ju of juridically defined borders. So we look at the difference because even Brazil itself in the 1930s walked with Great Britain and Venezuela to demarcate the so-called trijunction area where Brazil Guyana and Venezuela meet. And, and there was no difference, there was no concern raised about any issues of the borders not being sanctioned or, or san the sanctity of borders being changed. But I think that one has to look at it by the 1960s in the context of the changing global and regional environment. 1960s, Jeff Kennedy, John F. Kennedy, the anti-communist hysteria, one has to look back in 1959, the Cuban revolution, concerns raised about the communist threat in the region. 1960s also, we saw where Guyana, under Chedi Jagan, a self-avowed Marxist, and the movement towards independence had some impact on the thinking and of the US foreign policy making in relation to the Caribbean and to British Guyana. So we saw that kind of concern. And I believe that there was some influence of the United States in Venezuela, the Bittencourt regime, that actually went to the United, uh, the United Nations in 1962 and talked about a, a border issue that had been finally settled decades before, more than 60 years before, and talking about a fraudulent kind of, of, of demarcation of the border. A, a letter by a, a junior council, which was posthumously opened, along with the kind of pressure, I believe, from the United States at the time, in the, in the height of this beginning of the Cold War and this anti-communist hysteria moved to the United Nations. And we saw where that moved forward because by 1966, on the cusp of our, our independence, we had to move to 
the Geneva Agreement, which attempted to put some form of structure to, to this furious Venezuelan claim and to ensure that there was a, a period in which four years in which a mixed commission was established to see the extent to which there could be some form of movement towards a settlement. Now that did not work. And here we see by 1970, as you mentioned it again, with Dr. Eric Williams, and one has to look at, at that context too, because by 1970, I saw, I, I looked at some literature and I found that Dr. Williams was already talking about the potential for Venezuelan expansionism in the Caribbean. And that is also, uh, and his concern and the brokering of that 12 year freeze on the border if you looking for some form of, of settlement did not work. So by 1982, when there was a, a, an attempt to revive or, or, to, or, or to sign on to, or to a continuation, I think it was then President Herrera Campins mm -hmm. of Venezuela who decided that they were not going to renew that, uh, that uh, protocol of Port of Spain as it was known. But one has to also, as I say, look back a little bit, because in that intervening period between 1966, when you got independence, and 1982, in 1966, Venezuela moved to occupy Ancoco Island, or half of Ancoco Island, which under the Treaty of 1899, under the Arbitral Award, was Guyana's. And they still maintain control over that and the, the entire Ancoco Island up to today. So one has to look at it also in the context of you know, a historical movement, a, a, a series of aggressive acts against Guyana, even in the 60s, just after we became independent, you know, with a small state, newly independent, just feeling its way. In, 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 a, in, in a new international and geopolitical environment in this hemisphere, had to be looking to for new friends. You remember the start in the, in the 60s and early 70s, Guyana's moved to look to ensure that countries like Brazil would develop strong relations with, with that country in order for it to serve as a potential counterweight to Venezuelan aggression. We have to look, remember too that in that period, the movement to non-alignment by Guyana to ensure that the non-aligned movement also was, was acutely aware of Guyana's you know, concerns for its sovereignty and territorial integrity. One has to understand by 1972, Guyana played a leading role in removing the isolation of Cuba, 1972, this was Guyana, Trinidad, Barbados, and Jamaica, all in the context of the height of the Cold War and in the height of a, of a strong claim on Guyana. So I think we have to look at the context in which Guyana was operating as a newly independent state. And its first test, its first challenge was after independence, border, border questions, border challenges. Remember the issue of the New River Triangle yes. with Suriname. We had Venezuela. And also, one could argue, the threat from the Atlantic in our, in our sea defense. So that the only state, our only neighbor with which we had no issue was Brazil. So it was not, I think, by chance that, that you know, the powers that be at the time, the thinkers, Rashley Jackson and, and, and Ramphal and that cadre of, of, of strong thinking diplomatic experts were moving to ensure that we looked at the concentric circles of international relations first, ensuring that our neighbors, especially our strong neighbor Brazil, was fully au fait with our issues. The second was the hemisphere and the third 
concentric ring was the international community looking at the, the movements, the, the, the associate organizations, the UN, United Nations, the non-aligned movement, and African brothers and sisters who at that time, remember by 1974 and 75, Ghana was strongly linked to the struggles in Southern Africa. As a matter of fact, Ghana allowed Cuban planes to land here in 1975 to refuel and on their way to that struggle for Angolan independence. And we, and, and, and we had all kinds of, of, of issues in relation to that, I think, a very bold move in our foreign policy because we saw several efforts at reversing that trend towards you know, a very important uh, uh, contribution to a very important struggle in Southern Africa. So we, look, we, have, we have to understand that period. We're looking for, we were looking to ensure that we could develop the kind of interaction on many fronts. First on our border, ensuring that we, we had South American support from Brazil, we, we, we guided in some ways the movement towards normalization of relations and the establishment of formal diplomatic relations with Cuba. Remember 1976, we cannot forget CU-455, the bombing, the first act of international terrorism in the Caribbean, where our people, our young scholars lost their lives. So that period you know, but not only borders, but the bold kind of foreign policy initiatives which were coming out of Ghana saw that we were, uh, we faced many challenges and the border was only one of those. But as we go back to the specific issue of the Venezuela-Guyana border. And, and before, hold your thought there, because I thought, I think what you just did there was so instructive and I noticed our audience are really caught up in it. Because we have talked about Guyana's, what we call progressive foreign policy during that period. But this is the first time I'm having someone who is coming at it from um, the perspective of our conflict with Venezuela on the border issue. So if Mas Guyana is engaging in all these spheres of international relations, African liberation, um, hemispheric affairs, the non-aligned movement, um, uh, the OAS, where Venezuela sought to, to prevent us from, from joining the OAS, and that all that foreign policy of the early 1970s by the then um, PNC government was also, had also to do with broadening our um, scope of friends internationally as a defense against this aggression by Venezuela. And I think that is that reading of the foreign policy at that time is very important for today, because today, in a sense, we are faced with the mother of all aggressions from the Venezuelans. They've gone for this year. And we have to talk about how we defend ourselves. So I am very glad for that framing of the foreign policy of that time, beyond just normal foreign policy, but with particular objectives, one of which was to um, broaden our, 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 our scope of friendship with other countries around the world as a form of defense against aggression. You know, I think it was important to put it in that kind of frame, in, in, in the sense that not only did we move towards ensuring a broadening of the level of support and alliance. We, wanted, we, we, have, we recognized very early that diplomacy was the first line of defense. We had a very small army, not in any way uh, that could, in a sense, ba battle militarily with, uh, with Venezuela. We even signed on to the Treaty for Amazonian Cooperation in 1978, mm -hmm. the first time that Brazil had led a multilateral kind of institutional engagement in South America. And we were the first and only CARICOM state. And we're given our, our, our geographical location. 
you know, we, we, we signed on as a, a member, as a signatory to the Treaty for Amazonian Cooperation, another element in our movement to ensure that we can get the broader support. At that time, our effort to join the OAS was stymied. We didn't get to join the OAS until 1992. Yeah. So we had to look at other avenues for ensuring that we had that hemispheric, or we had a voice in the hemispheric fora. And we started with, indeed, the Treaty for Amazonian Cooperation, which gave us, which subsequently became the Amazon Cooperation Treaty Organization. So I think we, it is clear that there was that thinking, you know, that as a small post-independent state, we had to do all of those things. We had to look at CARICOM, you know, 1973 was the signing of the Treaty of Chagaramas. You know, we, we were upfront in that approach and ensuring that at the time there was unanimous, unanimous support for Ghana's, you know, for, for the territorial integrity and the sanctity of our borders and the sovereignty of a small post, in, you know, small state in, that, in, in this large geopolitical environment. So that we developed friends and, in, and as they say, influenced people at that time based on the correctness of our position in relation to our borders and the sanctity of our borders. Um, Dr. Carton, you know, um, we have heard several generation of Guyane generations of Guyanese uh, have heard about uh, the um, rich nature of the Venezuelan, the Esequibo section of our country, rich in minerals, gold, diamond, etc. And uh, um, that is why it uh, was important that we hold on to uh, our territory. And uh, that is why the Venezuelans, uh, in part, um, wanted to get hold of that territory. Well, here we are in 2023 with what was then dreams and speculations, now the truth. We are now a petrol state. We are now um, a state where um, the largest deposits of oil in recent times have been found. Um, 2023, Venezuela raising its head in a really vicious way. Um, uh, does it, am I correct in sum, summarizing and concluding that um, it has to do um, with that new found um, oil wealth? I would say that it is indeed part of the issue. Okay. And as it, you know, in international relations, we have to look at some levels of analysis. Wonderful. And, you know, the issue of, of the, global, the global environment, what is happening in states mm -hmm. and at the individual level. So that in, in some levels of analysis, I would say in the first instance, the changing global environment, the movement to ensure that oil indeed and, 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 and resource acquisition is maintained, especially by the US, is, is an issue that one has to consider. And I believe that the, 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 the presence of oil and the and and the potential benefits which you know and that's on the side which have not necessarily yet started to accrue to the benefit of our people but i hope it starts soon i would say that we can see that resource as a, as one of the reasons for this, this this unprecedented action and and aggression by venezuela now I would say also that when you look at the next level or the other level of analysis of what is going on in the state of Venezuela, mm -hmm. where there's a crisis, an economic crisis, there's a political crisis and a social crisis, and where you see that there's a, I, I think that one has to look at it in the context of a move to ensure a, re, a, a rebirth of a high level of patriotism among the Venezuelan people and therefore 
you know, they have been conditioned over the years. At school, you see Zona de Reclamacion, you, you see all kinds, you saw all kinds of arguments being advanced from early that this, this region is theirs. So I think that it's a it, it, it's an also an effort to rekindle that level of, of, of patriotism which seemed to be lost. And at the individual level, I think Mr. Chavez is recognizing that there's a that there's a reduction in popularity. You mean Mr. Maduro? Uh, sorry, Mr. Oh Lord. I sorry, I said Mr. Chavez. Yes. Yeah, Mr. Mr. Chavez as uh, Mr. Chavez's uh heir. Yes. <laughs> uh, Mr. Maduro is recognizing a reduction in popularity and therefore the need to kind of win win the, the support of the people again. So that they, I think it's a combination of factors which have brought this kind of, of, of aggressive approach, unprecedented, unprecedented and, and concerning. And you know, last night I saw an interview with uh, Delcy Rodriguez, the vice president of Venezuela, which is significantly worrying and of concern to people like myself. She talked about, you know, moving in that this this issue here of the referendum is one in which they're not yielding any kind of space. Um, I, I'm just paraphrasing, I can't remember mm -hmm. the exact words, but when, mm -hmm. but when you look mm -hmm. at the context and coming from a, a high level policymaker, I think the powers that be and the analysts in Guyana have to unpack that kind of interview, assess it from all the angles and ensure that we can really look for serious rebuttal to that because we're losing the, 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 the propaganda war in the first place. And, and, and we see this talk about direct to, to the, um, the recent bid for um, the oil the oil bid you know the the, the one that uh, what's it called the, 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 those those young ladies from Guyana who yes, also the oil, the oil blocks yes uh -huh. oil block, yes so the oil so they talk directly to this oil this resourcing and uh, arrangement where they see it as theirs a very a very spurious kind of claim and we see mm -hmm. fabrications emerging so I would say that there's a combination of factors to answer. Of factors that have led us here. No, but the, but, but the, 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 I think the most important is the oil, the resource uh, acquisition mm -hmm. and the potential mm -hmm. benefits which can accrue to a small state like Guyana. Right, and, right, right. You know, right. and the bullyism one could see, see yeah. that has let, emerged. From, from let, that let, let, let's go to a place here, Mark, and... Bearing in mind, we're not talking party politics here. Mm -hmm. We're talking um, a national issue. What, surely we have a government and uh, any response to what's happening here has to be led by the government, but other political and social forces in the country, I would say are, are duty bound to um, lend as much support to the national response. What and and what here is my question? What have we done that needs to be done, and what have we not done that needs to be done like yesterday? So first of all, what have we done that is commendable, and then what have we not done that we should have been doing since yesterday? David, I see a few things just recently. Mm -hmm. I say first. The fact that we have had some intervention, some interface, some discussion between government and opposition is a good start. However, I think we have to go beyond that. We have to have active engagement, day-to-day -day engagement on this issue and all the stake with all the stakeholders. But what I've seen, unfortunately, over the last couple of years is what I term Transactional diplomacy, short term, without a grand strategy, without a framework, a foreign policy framework 
that is recognizable and could be you know shared with the people that that is not present unfortunately so we have done the first move that is to have talks now i there's some there's some recommendations which have come from you know which are out there and i'm happy to hear just yesterday that one of my pet peeves is being addressed and that is the establishment of a more robust relationship with Brazil. I read last evening that uh, President Ali and President Lula met remotely and while not privy to any of the, uh, the discussions, one would hope that that is now the beginning and of a, a relationship that or, or the continuation or the rekindling or the re-engineering of a relationship that could see Brazil as a continue a strong counterweight to any aggression. And that must have, I believe, the national engagement, national involvement. We have to have that type of, 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 of engagement. Now, I also saw where Nicaragua has, has, has made a statement in support of Venezuela. And other countries, I understand, in Central America are likely to do so at this stage. Now, we have not had that kind of broad engagement with those countries as yet. And I believe that there must be some talk and action engage, involving the opposition with the appointment of special envoys, for example, to go to capitals, to really put our side, our position, the national position on those issues. So you ask, I, 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 I kind of conflating what has yes, been done. Yes, 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 go right there. What ought following. to be done. Mm. But I, I, I don't see, I haven't seen yet very strong movement to ensure that one, our people are kept informed at almost a daily basis on the issue. Because without that information, there's conjecture, there's misinformation, you know, and, and there's misinterpretation. So I think to look at what we haven't done, we have not yet fully briefed our people. Now, I went to the forum of the University of Guyana as a, as a guest, as a, as, a, as a member of the audience, and I heard Mr. Kid Nascimento indicate that the public relations campaign has begun. And when questioned a little bit more, he talked about the presence of bumper stickers. Now we have to go beyond the bumper sticker approach, my dear friend David. We have to ensure that this is a robust, this is a strong public relations campaign, which involves our people, which goes back to schools now, which goes to villages, it goes to the hinterland to, 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 to ensure that people are fully briefed. Because I see Venezuela acting in a very strong and unprecedented fashion, as I say again. And we seem to be look, lukewarm in either our response or our upfrontness in terms of you know dealing with the issue. So I think that is where we have some of the things we have not done. And I, I think that a good thing that we have done is to start the dialogue, start the discourse. But it has to go beyond that. It has to go with actionable engagement, action-oriented engagement. I, I, I am going to um, pick your brains here on another area of politics. So you, of course, you're an expert in foreign relations, but you're a political scientist. Um, to what extent, in a situation like this, in a country like Guyana, to what extent should the government cede some space to the official opposition in terms of fashioning a, a, a um, cross-party 
um, approach. And, and I'm mindful the reason I'm asking this question is because we know that we have, we, we have always been taught that govern, governments are there to govern. But, 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 but I'm, I'm thinking about Britain, for example, during the Second World War, setting up a war government. Um, and, and, and that model that when, that when you are faced with external aggression, you drop some of the, um, the barriers to um, functional cooperation between government and opposition. To, 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 to what extent something, um, not, not necessarily a war government, but to what extent we need more of in, a more structured involvement of the opposition? I would say that this is what, what might be termed a war room, a yeah. national war room should be established, not only with elements of the opposition, but I know that there are professionals out there, yeah. Guyanese, from all kinds of, with all kinds of expertise that could lend important experience and advice to fashion the responses and fashion policies that, 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 that embrace both the diplomatic and the strategic elements of this issue that are, I think, needed at this time. So what we, what we need to have, I think, is a, 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 an embrace, a total national embrace at this point. Embrace in relation to grappling with the, with, 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 with the complex issues of this crisis, because I call it a crisis, which, which, which we face an existential threat to our very national ex existence. And therefore, I, I, I feel that, you know, one, one has to look at for government, opposition, civil society, and the kind of professional who can bring unbiased, you know, strategic thinking to the table for us to have a, a structured grand strategy to deal not only with this issue, but the outcomes that become uh, necessary. So, and, and, and I, I, so, no, continue, finish, finish. No, no, please was, go ahead, please go ahead. No, 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 I, I, I love your idea of a war room because there I was struggling with the whole notion of a war government to know that that's not something that we're going to wrap our minds around tomorrow. But uh, there you are. I mean, uh, the idea of a war room that includes the government, the opposition, and of course they have the the, the construct of the parliament in which to do that. So yes. it's not something they, yeah. they in, in, invent. And to yeah. bring in to bring in other forces. And um, let me let me express my bias here, which I don't think you're going to agree disagree with. Um, to bring in our thinkers, now they are experts like yourself and so on, who have studied these issues over a period of time, know that part of the world um, in terms of the thinking of, 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 of the leaders and so forth. Um, I think our scholars um, at this time are most needed. I can think of no big, no big development in world history in which scholars, top scholars, have not been involved. And sometimes I, I, I feel that we in Guyana, because of the nature of our politics, have not made use of the, 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 the scholars that we have in there. You know, somebody like Rex Nedford would say, oh my God, we have more scholars per square feet for, the, for our own good, yeah. <laughs> right? And yet we don't. So I like the idea of the war room and the involvement, not just about government and opposition, because sometimes you may say, we put two of them in, the, in a room, you know, you don't get much done. But if yeah. you if you flesh that out with other professionals and scholars and civil society, I think it's a wonderful idea. Yes, David, you know, I um, it, it is unfortunate that over the years, the governments of Guyana, governments, yeah. past and present, Mm -hmm. have not utilized the kind of experience and expertise that uh, is here and in the diaspora who are willing to contribute, especially in, in situations such as this. And so I think this crisis, this existential threat, 
gives us the opportunity to engage with that kind of professional, that kind of scholar, that kind of person with thinking, you know, from a military, uh, you know, people who have, have studied geography, geopolitics, mm -hmm. and, 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 and that is unnecessary in the political sphere. But they're rather willing to make a contribution to this national effort. And I believe that if there's one thing that we could press for is that kind of war room engagement, which should be yesterday. Yesterday. Because we don't think we have much time. As I said, I'm, I'm concerned when I saw that interview with that lady, uh, the, the vice president for, of, of, of Venezuela. And when she also, I hope you have the, you, you, you will have the opportunity to look at it. Yes, I'm she, going to, as soon as I finish this program, I'm going to go look at yeah, it. She, yeah. she, she includes people from the Caribbean, Barbados, strategically, Belize, asking questions and making comments, Mexico, the Dominican Republic, Cuba, you know, so that they're, they're, they're targeting nation states to lend support. Now, we have to, we have to be, um, you know, very strong. We have to be upfront in dealing, in countering that kind of fabricated claim by putting our position out there, argue for, in, you know, for the rule of law to prevail, for the principles of international law to, be, to, to guide us and in issues such as those. Or as we, you know, we, we find ourselves lacking the kind of support that is needed. We need to go to the Vatican. We need to go to the African Union. We need to go to the BRICS. We, want, we need to go to the chairman, the current chairman of CELAC, Community of Latin American and Caribbean States. And you know who that is? A Caribbean leader, Mr. Gonzalez. Yes, Mr. yes, yes, yes. He's the current chairman, the pro temporal chairman. And I've heard of not a word from CELAC. And I'm not being political. I'm saying no. the reality is that we have an organization, 33 members from the hemisphere that ought to be briefed on Guyana's position and, and, and for statements unequivocal to be made in relation to the issue, and we hear nothing. There's another organization called the ACS, the Association yes. of Caribbean States, which came out of the West Indian Commission in 1995, it was established. You know, the wise men of the Caribbean, all the countries washed by the Caribbean Sea and CARICOM were eligible for membership. And we hear not a word from the Association of Caribbean. And, and then you speak in Caribbean uh, has played an important role in that organization. We were the founding thinkers. Yeah. It came out of the, it came out of the, uh, of the uh, time for action, the report of the West Indian Commission in 1992, talking 1992. about and deepening the integration movement simultaneously. Yes. And that yeah. brought it, that gave, that gave the, the embryonic movement our own tree that Ramphal played. Of the Association of Caribbean States. Yes, our own tree that Ramphal played a pivotal yes. role in that in that you in know, that process. And I don't I, I don't hear a word in yeah. relation. So my view is that we have these concentric circles of international relations. We need a structured, strategic, you know, policy framework for which and or or to the preparation of which could engage the same membership of the war room we talk about so that we know if we if we were, we were to develop the concept of you know of the special envoy we can give them that kind of, of, yes. of, of, of document that paper that's and so everybody's singing from the same hymn ship in wherever capital you have to go to ensure that our position is clearly articulated yeah, a, a, a roving ambassador out there. Um, going from, Mark, let us stay with CARICOM for a moment because um, those are our quote-unquote natural allies, um, the members of CARICOM. But we know that um, countries in CARICOM benefited from um, Venezuelan largesse, and I'm talking about the petro Caribbean. Um, initiative that was started by Chavez. And so therefore, CARICOM is, the CARICOM issue is not a straightforward slam dunk, slam dunk issue. 
I, and I'm saying that in pursuit of your own player tonight, that we must be in those capitals um, uh, tomorrow, yesterday, and we must take nothing for granted. Speak a little bit about uh, the nuance of CARICOM on this Venezuela guy and issue. Interesting question, uh, interesting perspective. You know, I believe that national interest sometimes trumps any other kind of you know, uh, engagement. And we see it in the context of the small states, especially those of the Eastern Caribbean, you know, Dominica, St. Vincent, Antigua, Grenada, St. Lucia, and so on. We see a very narrow national interest perspective being shared. And I believe that the issue of dependency or dependence on the Petro-Caribbean I mean, I even hear Barbados talking about the resurgence of petro -Caribbean. And I was bold enough a few days ago to argue that we may want to re-engineer petro -Caribbean. Let us look at the possibility of the new oil-producing states, right? Guyana, Suriname, soon to become one. We can look at the, at, at, at the, the I call it the Guyana Shield, corridor and seek to embrace Brazil and we also think about enlarging it. You know, there was the San Jose Accord of 1981 mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That, that, that had Mexico and, and, and Colombia so that we can, in a sense, fashion a new petro Caribbean that does not have those states solely dependent and on Venezuela. On Venezuela. And because I think, I, I, I know, I have not seen as yet any one of those uh, small states come individually and unequivocally support Ghana in this issue. Yes, yes. That's right. worrying. And CARICOM you know, has issued, CARICOM, the CARICOM secretary has issued a statement. And I listened to, I listened to one of the leaders say, say that the CARICOM Secretariat. Yes, 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 yes. She That's said that. Said that. Yes, right. The CARICOM <laughs> Secretariat as against CARICOM. But I don't want to bash CARICOM. I want to. I want to see the extent to which we can bring those on board, those who are wavering, by 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 considering a shift, a changing petro Caribbean arrangement. You know, because we see small states. Some of them, you know, the populations are small um the needs are great we can even have our exports consider looking at how guyana could use some of the oil that is accrued to it yeah and even we engage the the the, the, the uh joint partners you know the the exxon mobile and so on so give or, or, or to sell some of their oil at concessionary prices to small states of the region, reworking the whole and uh, you know arrangement. Some people might argue that you know um, the bottom line for those states uh, for those uh, corporations is profit. And but I think that we have enough skilled negotiators to look in the context especially of the of the, uh, of the plights of post-COVID economies in the region. They haven't, they haven't recovered. Now we can look at some new strategic thinkers, new new initiatives that could move Petra Caribbean into a different type of mode and, and, and remove the dependence on one state, Venezuela, to a broadened engagement and a, and a new Caribbean energy policy that could perhaps go beyond fossil fuel that could look at the benefits of, of for example, uh, ethanol. And Brazil is, is, is key in that regard. Yeah. You yeah. can look at solar. And, and so broaden the, 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 the thinking on, 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 on energy policy. We, you know, grounded in this view that we have to move away from the dependence on one state for petro -Caribbean. 
Dr. Mark Courtney here tonight. Um, I am I am certain um, that you all would agree with me and has brought you some new perspectives on this issue um, uh, that we are faced with. We have taken the position in this program that Venezuela is not a straightforward issue. This issue is much more complex. It has always been a complex issue, but it is now much more complex since we have become uh, a petrol state. Um, it, has, it has made all our issues, all our issues, um, more complex than they were before we discovered oil. And so um, I'm very glad um, on your behalf to have um, Professor here. I, I, I didn't press him very much on what we may call the Burnham model of foreign policy and how relevant, because he laid it out, that old model of foreign policy and uh, how we could utilize aspects of that model today, um, because of course, uh, nothing stays still in time. One of the only things that we are certain about as human beings is that uh, um, tomorrow will be Saturday. <laughs> We know that Friday will not be delayed for another 24 hours. Tomorrow is going to be Saturday. The change is the only thing that we are we are certain of. But I promise, I promise, um, Commissioner Cole, my my sister, I promise that I will we will invite um, Professor back um, in 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 the very near future because we continue to cover this issue in a very very intense way as i said this week we had henry jeffrey we had aubrey norton and now we have professor um mark Courtney. we haven't tapped yet on um uh uh, uh mr greenwich who is a front and center of this issue but i i i promise you all that we're going to try to get him here he's of course in great demand now but we're going to continue to cover this issue. And as you can see, that the more we bring fresh and new faces to this issue, we get new perspectives um, on it. I like the idea of the war room. I like the idea of the war room as something that at least we can agree on even in a contentious place like Guyana. Um, Dr. Corton, is there anything that I that you badly wanted to say that I didn't ask a question that you um that 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 you want that you wanted to say that you didn't get a chance to say? Well, all I would like to do at this stage is to reiterate the need for this to be seen as a national issue. And that we all have to throw down our political gloves, you know, and look at it in the context of a survival of a nation, a nation state. We have to look at it in the context of an existential threat. We have to ensure, I believe, an important component is keeping our people informed. And I think that is what has to be a critical element in the emergence of any kind of uh, public relations and uh, strategic thinking agenda. Additionally, I don't think we can we, we can look at a static kind of situation. It changes every day, as you as you as you quite rightly indicated. We have to broaden our alliance base. We have to ensure that we look at where are some of the gaps how we can look at developing new alliances and new allies in this in this in this particular issue look where the convergences of interests for example colombia has a, 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 a border issue with venezuela and i am not sure that we have that we have engaged and 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 and, and tapped into that convergence at this stage just one example so that I think that we need to ensure that at that level, the, the development of new new allies, to, and and even to look forward to ensuring that we might maybe develop a country support group, because you know that's popular uh, that has been done. I mean, we, we used to chair the council from Namibia yes. many many decades ago yes. as, as as they had these issues. 
we, we, we see where there was a support group for Haiti so that we could look at countries that have, you know, some similar interests that have unequivocal support for opposition to form that kind of support alliance group. So we have a, a set of different levels of engagement. We have to look at also at potential military alliances, how strong they, they you know, we have a small army, we don't know what kind of engagement is going to be. We have to be ensure that we have at least a deterrent force. Now, I might go even further and argue for a move to sensitize the United Nations Security Council very quickly, even before the third of, of uh, December, when it's going to be that that um, that referendum to talk about this potential threat to our sovereignty and let them know at least. And, and if, if one could think outside the box, look at for some, I don't want to call it preventive, but some humanitarian military mission, multilateral, you know, global in scope, that could add some deterrent impact to that, to that potential aggression. So, I mean, those things I think could be more discussed Look at, the, look at the potential challenges to that, look at the opportunities for those in a war room. So this is why I think it's, it, it, it is important for that set of thinkers to, to, to sit and let ideas contend, so to speak. Thank you very much, my brother. And I, I will be calling, uh, uh, calling on you um, again very, very, very shortly as this issue develops. We hope that this issue will not last but we have to be realistic. As you said earlier in the program, the Venezuelan issue is, is really an existential threat um, to Guyana. And so it is not going to go away tomorrow. And there is a lot of work to be done. And often governments by their very nature are not uh, institution. It's, the government is not an institution that will come out and say, we will do this progressive thing, we'll do that progressive thing. Often. The pressure on government to take progressive positions um, comes from um, our, our non-governmental institutions, from our scholars, from our civil society leaders, and, and, and leaders of our people's organizations. So we have work to do um across the board and we take responsibility on this program as a, a public entity that is engaged in what i loosely call public scholarship because we are all scholars when it comes to certain national issues and we intend to play our role at educating sensitizing um on this issue again thank you very much dr Corton. I appreciate it, uh, your invitation, and thank you so very much. Dr. Mark Curtin there, of course, former uh, lecturer at the University of Guyana, um, was once uh, 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 the shortest serving uh, vice chancellor of the University of Guyana. Um, and then he spent a long time in Trinidad at the University of the West Indies um, at the Institute of International Relations. As old people say in the village, he know what he's talking about. He had just come on this thing. So his credentials um, speak for themselves. And so we were very, very glad to have him here tonight to really open up open up this issue in a way that we could be proud of as a politics 101 family. It's the weekend, so you all stretch out a little bit, keep up on the news, remember what's happening there in um, the Gaza Strip there, the, um, what, what Bob Marley says, you know, man to man can be so unjust. Um, you know, I, I didn't get a chance to stitch that in with um, Dr. Corton tonight because there are they're, they're always linkages on these things that are happening. He did begin the program by saying there are things that are happening globally, globally, that impacts even small countries like us. Um, and, and we are no longer just a small 
country in terms of population, in terms of um, size, and so on. We may consider a small country. But as a petrol state, we are a big country. We are a big country. And here's our opportunity um, uh, to, to lead. Lead ourselves. There are other issues as they relate to this Venezuela thing that we are going to tease out on this program. So stay tuned. Again, thank you all so much for staying with us um, another evening, another night. Um, you know, Barnum used to say, watch with me one more um, one more night, you know what I mean? And we have several nights. But we know the storm may be raging tonight, but as, uh, um, as they say, the Christians, joy cometh. Joy cometh in the morning. But we cannot wait for that joy to come. We have to do our work because God helps those who help themselves. Love you all.